church. Who's excited for church this afternoon? Dave's excited. <laughs> Claire's excited. Graham's excited. And that's everyone that's here. But it is great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to dive straight in and do some worship. But before we do that, we're going to do our creed. I know, we're going to mix it up a little bit and do it a bit differently. So we're going to do our creed, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to worship. So today's creed is taken from Bucky's favourite, the uh, Heidelberg Catechism, and it is question and answer number 34. So I'm going to read the question, and then we're all going to read the answer together. Please tell them where it is. Sorry? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? That's a very good question. You'll find it in the notes section on the HCC online page. So I'll give you a quick second to find that. So uh, here is the question, and then we'll read the answer. Why do we call him our Lord? Because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has set us free from sin and the tyranny of the devil and has brought us body and soul to be his very own. Father, I thank you that you have brought us to be your very own, that you have brought us to be your very own, that we can gather this afternoon to worship you, that we can gather this afternoon to praise you. We might not be able to meet together in person, but we can meet over... Uh, over the internet Uh, and I thank you that we can worship you together we can praise you together we can glorify you together let's worship
your fire fall down To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden You are our one design You alone are holy Only you are worthy God Let your fire fall down Yeah, wherever you are right now and whatever you're doing as you're listening to this, let's just turn our attention to him. Let's just give him 100% of our attention this moment. Um, let's just turn our affection towards him. Jesus, we are here for you and for you alone. We want to give you 100% of ourselves in this moment. We just love your presence, God.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still in all At break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Who oh, trampled day? Where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the King. Oh, pray. Stronger and I think compared 
uh, we're going to do communion together. I'm going to give you a hot second to go find your bread and your wine. Uh, and as you do that, I'm going to read uh, a verse for us. So I'm going to read from uh, I'm going to read from Matthew 26, 26 to 29. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And when he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So, Father, as we, as we break bread together and as we share wine together, we thank you that this is, we are part of a new covenant in which you have died for us and bared our sins. And we stand not in our own righteousness, but in yours. So, uh, why don't we grab the bread and let's break it together. And we thank you that you poured out your blood on us to save us. So, as I say, that we could stand righteous, not in our own, but in yours. So let us drink the wine together. Father, we love you. We love to worship you. We love to gather together, even if we are online, to worship you together, to sing songs, to take communion, to partake in our, our service together. We love it, and we love worshiping you. We love glorifying you. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for leading us in worship. Lovely wife. Thank you. And I believe it's over to you. Lovely. Hello, hello. So in just a moment, um, Pete is going to read our Bible verse for Graham before we welcome him up. But just before we do that, um, we just wanted to um, quickly mention a few announcements that um, are applicable to you guys for the coming weeks. Um, but also, firstly, we just wanted to um, create a space to take up our offering um, the thing that I love about Hope City Church is it's family. And as family, um, we all have responsibility. We're all partakers of this. Um, and I was thinking about the verse that we love because he first loved us and thinking our money, our houses, everything that we have is a gift of God. And he gave that to us. And now we have the opportunity to sow that back into what he's doing, um, not only in Hope City Church, but then also through Hope City Church, we give um, and want to sow into other things that the Lord is doing in our city um, and around the world. So as we take up um, our offering, there are a few different ways that we can do that. If you would like to, um, apparently there is a button, very technical, in mm. the chat um, that you can press to give some money um, into Hope City Church, or apparently um, the account details are in the notes if you would like to set up a standing order. But everything that we do, um, we do from a place of being family and giving back to God because he first gave to us. So it is an honour to sow into what the Lord is doing at Hope City Church. So if you want to be a part of that, then this is the time to sow in. So I'm going to quickly pray and then I will say some announcements. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, everything that you have gifted to us, Lord. Um, we thank you for your love. Um, we thank you that you are a provider, Lord. We just thank you for all of the gifts that you've given to us. And we just pray that we would grow in the gift of giving, would grow in the, ga the grace of giving, Father. So yeah, have your way amongst us. We just thank you for the generosity of this family um, and that we all get to be partakers of something 
something bigger than ourselves. So Father, would you just um, bless this offering today and Lord, would you use it for great and mighty works for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Um, and for this week, very exciting. This Tuesday night, um, we will be doing apparently a live pancake session, which is going to be flipping awesome. <laughs> um Terrible. I'm just imagining Graham doing some live pancake making. Guys, it's going to be fantastic. If it's anything like Jamie Oliver, then this is just watch this face. Graham, I how's mean, your, how's I your am flipping, building this. Graham? <laughs> You're flipping, it's flipping great. great, apparently. Well, if you want to tune in live to this com- com- comical evening, then that is going to be on Tuesday, this Tuesday at 6.30. Um, and I would imagine, Graham, that the link is going into the WhatsApp group. Is that correct? The, the link, the Zoom link, is it going into the... Uh, Graham is going to put the Zoom in the WhatsApp group for you to join on Tuesday if you would like to. So have your pancake in true Blue Peter style, have your pancake mixture made beforehand. Um, and then... Um, Yes, we are, as a church, obviously itching to get back to meeting in person. Um, so we want to um, just consider this and pray for, about this and pray for the right timing, which we are doing as a leadership team. But we want you to know as our church family that is being considered and we are making sure that all the right measures are in place. So watch this space. We will keep you posted with more information on that. And finally, um, if you have not heard, we have something called Midweek, which is where every Every other Tuesday, we meet online over Zoom um, as family, and at the moment, we're looking into Easter, so Graham kicked that off fantastically this last Tuesday, Um, and then we split into smaller groups for some discussion. I will say, I think it has been absolutely fantastic, you know, we have little bits of Zoom and screen fatigue, but it has just been such a fantastic place to connect with people, so if you don't already partake in that and would like to um then in the chat there is a way for you to join a small group um so press that button and let the magic happen um but for now that is it from me and peter is going to read the bible verse for this morning and welcome graham up lovely well, that, let me just find the verse that i am reading So this is uh, 1 John 4, verses 12 all the way to 21. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, cool. So, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this we, uh, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. Sorry. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So Graham, why don't you come up here and I'll quickly, quickly pray for you. So Father, we, we pray for Graham as he comes up here and he prepares to bring your word. We pray that it would be a refreshing word, that it would be a, a powerful word, that most of all, though, it would be a word that glorifies you and is true to, to your word. 
And we pray, pray confidence on Graham to speak boldly, to speak passionately, and to speak truth in love. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pete. Thank you so much, uh, Pete and Pippa, for um, taking care of the service, and uh, also for Dave and Claire, who you can't see, uh, who have been here setting up and, and working behind the scenes to make sure we've got a service be to be broadcast today. So thank you to all of you guys. Um, also to my dad, who was here earlier, setting the PA up. Um, we couldn't do this without you. So a big hello to all of you at Hope City Church. Uh, we miss you all, and we're so looking forward to getting back together as soon as we possibly can to meet in person. And also a hello to those of you who are joining us maybe for the first time this Sunday. Uh, God bless you, and uh, we hope that today's word from 1 John brings hope and edification and breakthrough for you. So you are most welcome to join us today. Jonathan Edwards, who was a, a Puritan, a Puritan preacher in the 1700s in America, he said this, God's love is the most unstoppable force in the universe. Now, when you consider some of the forces that are active in the universe today, the cosmological constant, the speed that the universe is expanding, the force of gravity, the nuclear force that exists within every atom, that, that's quite a statement. And the Apostle John takes care here to repeat again what he said back in verse 8, that God is love. The Apostle wants us to see that it's not just that God does love, it's that he is love. Charles Spurgeon, the Victorian preacher, said this, quote, There is no light in the planet but that which cometh from the sun. There is no light in the moon but that which is borrowed. And there is no true love in the heart but that which cometh from God. Love is the light, the life, and the way of the universe. We felt that it was quite serendipitous, really, that today, of all days, on Valentine's Day, our scripture reading should involve this particular passage. God is love, and perfect love casts out all fear. Uh, that we did that, uh, it was quite by accident. We didn't actually appropriate this verse for today, but it's just the way that the readings fell. So here we are discussing love. Love is a funny thing. Love is a weird, funny thing. It, to be honest, it, there's nothing else quite like love. Love has got this kind of unrivaled power, this unrivaled kind of potency to work wonders in the human heart. You know, a, a child... It's been shown time and time again um, by experiment that, that a child who experiences consistent love uh, from a, a caregiver or a parent in their formative years is far more likely to be happier, uh, more physically healthy um, than a child who, who does not receive that same kind of st stable upbringing and, and love. Yet, this is the funny thing about love is that although... Love is powerful and is able to wield such an impact, such a powerful impact in, in our human hearts. It's actually only possible to love from weakness. So it's this thing that, that exerts an incredible amount of, of power in your heart, but at the same time it's impossible to love without being weak in a sense. Because it's impossible to love somebody without opening yourself up, is it? Without vulnerability, love can't exist. Love requires vulnerability. It was um, one of the great German theologians, I forget, Schleiermacher, who said that essentially love is giving, love is sharing. Love is what happens when you give yourself away. And we see this in the institution of marriage. If you've ever, well, you, I'm sure you have seen many weddings, but when I uh, have conducted some, some weddings of, of my own. I've had the honor of officiating at weddings. Uh, one of my favorite parts of a wedding is where the father of the bride comes up the aisle and, um, and the question is asked, who is here to give away? Uh, or in words to that effect, who is here to give away the bride? Um, marriage is the highest institution and highest form of human 
relationship. And it is, in essence, the giving of one human being to another. Love is something that we practice. Love is a feeling, yes. Let's be clear to say that. I think sometimes in our preaching at weddings, we want to kind of err on the side of caution and we want to talk about love as being a habitual thing that, that we do. But we mustn't rule out the fact that love is also a feeling. But it is a practice also. Love is intentionally giving yourself away, isn't it? It's not an accident. Love is not an accident. You might fall in love with somebody. Your feelings might be captured by a certain individual. I'm sure you all probably have experiences of that. And uh, it does almost feel involuntary. But, but true love involves a certain level of intentionality. It is the intentional giving away of yourself. And more importantly, love is not like a J-O-B. When we work, we give things away, don't we? We serve somebody by giving away a certain gift or attribute. Uh, perhaps in Pete's example, when he fits kitchens, he is giving of himself, but he is also requiring something in return, i.e. he doesn't work for free. That's true, isn't it, Pete? You don't work for free. He doesn't work for free. So love is slightly different in the respect that when we love somebody and give something of ourselves away, there is not a demand for something in return. Love is giving oneself away without the requirement of repayment. To be loved, now we're talking about what it is to receive love. To be loved is literally, literally, to live in grace. That's what love is. To be loved is to live in grace. And what is grace? It's unmerited favor. To be loved is to live in grace. To be seen, to be known, and to be cherished. That's what it is to be loved. I want you to just capture that for a moment. To be loved is to be seen. So all of you is seen, or as much as it is possible to see, is acknowledged. It is known. The person who loves you knows you. And they affirm you. They value you. They cherish you. To be loved is to be under grace. It's to be known, to be cherished, to be seen for who you are and valued. John tells us that our love is in need of perfecting. He tells us that our love is something that as Christians is being perfected. It's in the process of being perfected perfected. The Greek word comes from the word telos there, which can mean completed. And I think that's the way it's translated in the NIV. So you could read that as your love is being completed. And how is this done? Well, John says your love is perfected or completed by virtue of the fact that God abides or remains within you. This is the whole doctrine of union with God. Union with God. And it is through this relationship of God coming and living, tabernacling within you by his Holy Spirit that we begin to be perfected in love. Well, I think sometimes when we read these things in the Bible, they can take on an almost poetic form. We, we read this verse about perfect love and perfect love casts out fear. And it almost takes on a kind of Shakespearean quality. We love to quote it. We love to put it on T-shirts, put it on websites. But perhaps we don't always take it as it's fully meant because of the beauty of the words. But the inference of this idea, the inference rather, the, the thing that we can reason to by virtue of the fact that John says we need to be perfected is what? Well, we infer that our love, and love is not perfect to begin with. That's the simple, logical inference. If our love needs perfecting or needs completing, then something, therefore, must be lacking in our love that needs completion. Our love, our human love, wonderful as it is, isn't it? Love is literally, in a sense, what makes the world turn around. Love is what enables communities and families and societies to function. Without love, 
the human race would not truly be human. Love, as many great philosophers and theologians have noted, is the evidence of the fact that we are made in the image of God. It is part of, perhaps, the Imago Dei uh, that's mentioned in Genesis 1.27. You know, in his image, he made them male and female. And it is love that truly speaks of the image of God in mankind. It's wonderful. Love is incredible. Love is what causes the human race to be different than any other species on the planet. It's what makes us transcend uh, as, a, as a species. Uh, every, every other created order on the earth. But even so, our love is tainted to one degree or another with the aftertaste of original sin. Everything that constitutes humanity, our reasoning abilities, our emotions, our um, abilities to perform certain actions, uh, certainly our ability to love, all have been diffracted, broken in some way, shape, or form by the fall. And love is no different. So what's the outcome? It simply means this, that when we love, as glorious as that may be, as wonderful as that is, we don't love perfectly. And you don't need evidence from me to tell you that that's true. You see, each one of you will have your own experiences and stories to tell of the pain and damage that can be wrought by an imperfect love. It's broken, an imperfect love at its worst that will always expect something in return, won't it? I'm sure we all know that kind of love. Perhaps we've even given that type of love that that doesn't come free. There are strings attached. An imperfect and broken love uses its object for its own ends. An imperfect and broken love casts away the object of its desires when it no longer becomes useful. Therefore, love is withdrawn. Broken and imperfect love at its worst depends upon performance, doesn't it? It's contingent upon performance. It is not what we might call unconditional. Human, imperfect, sinful love comes with conditions. Broken and imperfect love at its worst is controlling. It cannot let you truly be free. You're not allowed to change. A broken and imperfect love at its worst, at really the extremity of its brokenness, is ultimately abusive. In this situation, only one individual in that relationship is ever really vulnerable. And their vulnerability is always exploited. What's the natural reaction then of anybody who has ever experienced this kind of broken and imperfect love? Well, it's fear. It's fear. It's a fear of giving yourself away, of being vulnerable again, you know, once bitten, twice shy. As the saying goes, it's a fear that you cannot ever trust anyone again with your heart. It's a fear that perhaps that individual who loved you in this broken way was actually right after all. And that you truly are unlovable. You're an unlovable creature. It's also, I think, a fear that comes in, which is a fear of yourself. Each of you will have experienced this on a different level. You'll all have your own stories to tell. But sometimes the fear that can get in, when we have been loved in that imperfect, abusive way to one degree or another, there can be a fear that enters of oneself. There's a fear that something is crucially wrong with you. That you are not free to truly be you. Because being truly you might be wrong. The result of this is that we can end up growing and living in self-defense mode. We've always got our guard up. We aren't really sure how to be as Jesus was in this world. And if anything is known by followers of Jesus and 
non-followers of Jesus alike, is that this, this man lived from a place of deep love. He valued every single person he came into contact with. He saw them, he knew them, and he loved them. Even when they abused him, he still loved them perfectly. But we're not sure how to be like that. Because most often we're fighting against fears. Now maybe this might not be familiar to you. Perhaps you, these things are not ringing a bell. Well, I think this verse can also speak to us. Perhaps not just about our conscious fears. But this verse can also speak to us about the imperfection in our own hearts concerning love. Perhaps we have just enough love in the reservoir of our hearts to spare for our spouse. You know, maybe we made sure we bought a card this weekend. We bought a present. Well done, Pete. She got the e-card. Fantastic. Maybe we've got in just enough love for our families. And we feel rather pleased with ourselves. But when we're required to love those who hate us, which is indeed what Jesus asked us to do, then we begin to make excuses. Well, Lord, I, I don't really hate anybody, and no one really hates me, and so, you know, I'll, I'll love whoever you put before me, Lord. I'm doing a pretty good job with my wife and my family, but when required to spill the love out into communities of people, then we come up short. You see, love isn't something we can just force. It's not something we can just make happen out of sheer willpower. It isn't like having good manners or resolving to look after your body. It, it, it can't be done through a strong will. I am going to love more people. I am going to do it. It doesn't work like that. To be perfected in love, we must come into contact with perfect love. There has to be a transaction that takes place. You know, I can illustrate this. Perhaps we can look at great moral heroes throughout history. We all know of a few of them. Corrie ten Boom in the Second World War who hid Jews from the Nazis. Uh, Mother Teresa washing the feet of poor orphans in Calcutta. George Muller, who put a home together for orphan children in Bristol. We can look at these characters. We can fill our bookshelves with stories of people that demonstrated the love of Jesus. But even then, something still needs to take place inside of us. Otherwise, this is just information that goes in here but doesn't necessarily get to here. You see, all of these individuals, your Corrie ten Booms, your George Mullers, your Mother Teresa's, there are many more. All of these individuals, all they did was do what Spurgeon said the moon does, which is to capture the light of the perfect light better than perhaps we do. We may see the light in their lives. We might see the love being reflected off of their lives, we can be impressed by that light. We can feel challenged by that light. But the bottom line is, you will not be transformed into the same likeness that these individuals show by simply staring at their light. We have to step out of the darkness and bask in the source of the light that they bask in, the sun we're talking about the love of God. It's when we behold perfect love that we become transformed. When God's love shines in through the windows of our souls, I love that expression, that our soul has windows. The eyes, the mind. When that love begins to flood in, through the windows of our souls and pours into every dark recess, warming the cold, dark walls of our indifference, our love begins to grow. 
That's when the transformation begins to happen. John says that perfect love is something that we can know. Something that we can know. He says, we have known and we have believed the love of God. The love of God is something that is knowable. It's real. God's love is supernatural. Though we can't see God now with our natural eyes, we can physically understand his love. We can know his love in our souls. We can experience his love in a very real place, temporarily, here and now. We can do this and know it to be true through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. We can know the truth of God, that he loves us. You know, Augustine, he believed that when John said that God is love, that he was literally talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what Augustine believed anyway. Augustine believed that the Holy Spirit, in a sense, is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. Seeing as the Father, by his name, has a clear relationship to the Son, and the Son, by his name, has a clear, distinct relationship as the Son of the Father. But the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son. Augustine believed that his operation was essentially as a bond of passion between the other two members of the Trinity. Make of that what you will, but I think it's interesting. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you see, have existed eternally in relationship with one another. And that's what is meant really by God is love. Love can't exist where there is only one being. Love needs an object. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have loved one another eternally in this relationship. It is one perfect being loving another perfect being perfectly. <laughs> and it's that love that John says that you and I can know. That a Christian can know that love. Well, how, how could that be? How could it be that we as natural, physical, limited beings could know this perfect love? Again, I think one of the greatest doctrines of all of Christianity, perhaps one of the most misunderstood doctrines of all Christianity, is this doctrine of our union, union with Christ. You see, when we become Christians, it's not simply that we start believing certain things. It's not just that there's an assent of the mind to certain truths of Scripture. It's not a purely rational thing, is it, Christianity? It's not like philosophy. Uh, It's not like being a mathematician. Becoming a Christian is a supernatural event. Uh, One is taken from darkness to light. One is taken from being a hater of God to a lover of God. But perhaps most importantly, one is adopted. One is adopted into the divine family. Uh, There is a new birth that takes place. And that new birth is that you are born again, that you are in Christ. There is a union, a, a very, very real and essential union between the Christian and Jesus Christ himself. So in this, this literally means that the perfect love with which the Father loves the Son is literally poured out on you. It's poured out on the Christian in the same measure that it's poured out on Jesus by virtue of the fact that you are in Christ. You're in Jesus. So the same love that's directed at him by the perfect father is the same love that you get as a Christian. Everything that Jesus has is now yours rightfully by his work at Calvary, and that includes the love with which he's loved. The proof of this, of course, is that we have the Holy Spirit, and it's he that works this in us. I want for you to just think for a moment 
about this love of God. I want you to take a moment to think about it. And this is the, this is the important thing, really, because understanding the love of God takes all of us. It's not something that should simply be done by rationale and reading the scriptures and knowing in our heads what's meant. It's also supposed to take up the emotions. It's supposed to fill the soul. You know, you're a complex being. And so something as great and big as the love of God can't just be understood in one of those ways. You know, we shouldn't just try and experience it in our feelings and switch off our minds. But equally, we shouldn't just try and understand it theologically, but, but push aside the feelings. It's, it's got to be known experientially as well as theologically. Let's just take a moment to think about God's love, though. In contradistinction to what we said earlier about the imperfect love that we utilize in this world, that we have. Well, first off, at the very start of our study of First John, what was one of the big statements that we heard? It was God is light. God is light. What was meant by that was that God is holy. He is pure. There is no darkness in him at all. Holiness is... Holiness is something that we as fallen individuals can only truly marvel at in this world. We can begin to grow in it, but holiness is so much other than what we know. You see, every one of our good intentions, every great action that we do is mottled by darkness and sin. Even for the greatest works that we do, sometimes in the motives there can be selfish reasons. But in God, there's no such thing. So God's love is pure. God's love has no motives and anything. When God loves you, he's not trying to get something from you. He's not loving you in order to use you. But this is what's subtly taught and preached so often. God loves you because he wants to use you. No, God loves you because he loves you. He loves you because you're in Christ and God loves his son and he cannot do otherwise. He loves you with a holy perfect love he doesn't love you to manipulate you he's not loving you for some sinful desire he loves you with a holy and perfect love wholesome God's love is unchangeable it's unchangeable when we think about the nature of God what's one of the things that we know from scripture it's that God cannot change there are things that God cannot do God cannot change it's what we call immutability in theological terms. And so what that means is that God's love for you is immutable. It cannot change. There's no such sense of he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not with God. He loves you. There's no off switch. There's no shadow of turning with God's love towards you. Which is so hard for us to grasp when we are used to loving people in a conditional sense which says... You know, if you don't perform to these standards, I'm going to have a hard time loving you the same as I did yesterday. It's not the same with God. So in my worst moment as a born-again Christian, when I fall, when I sin, when I mess up, God's love has not changed at all. The power and the luminosity of his love is the same in your darkest moment as it is in your greatest moment. It's unchangeable. It's familial. When we enter in and we're born again, we're born again into a family. We're loved by a father and we're loved as sons, as children, as sons and daughters. We're nurtured by this love. This is a love that cares for us, that seeks to grow us as believers and doesn't give up on us. It's an all-powerful love. It's potent. This is one of the great things about the love of God is that it, it turns Saul's into Paul's. And there's that song, isn't there? The, over, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now, we take the word reckless out and we've got a great song. But some of it is fantastic. And the fact is that he goes after the one. He goes after the one. And you and I are that one sheep. Constantly getting stuck in ditches, constantly messing up, tripping up, but the love of God comes after you time and time and time again, and it will not let you go. You see, my faith 
that I'm going to endure to the last day when I go to glory is not in me. My faith is not in my ability to continually follow God and his commands. My faith is in God. If it were over to me to ensure that I was going to run the race fully, then we're in trouble because I'm a starter, but I'm not necessarily a finisher. My faith and trust that I will endure to the end is in God's love, that he will never let me go. It's eternal. God's love is eternal. It has always been. Now, that's a crazy thing to imagine because we have finite minds that really only do well when we can think of a a definite beginning and a definite end. And when we think of dimensions, we have to have parameters. You know, it's the idea of thinking about a limitless universe and cosmos. Our heads begin to spin. But God's love is eternal. It has had no beginning and it will have no end. There will never be a moment when God does not love his children. Because there'll never be a moment when God does not love his son. God's love is unconditional to those who are in Christ. There are no conditions to those who are in Christ. God's love is poured out forever upon his children. It's always present. Did you ever think about that? God is omnipresent. That's one of the things that our children learn in the kids' catechism. We know that God is everywhere. And if he's everywhere, then guess what? That means his love is everywhere. His love can be felt in a jail cell far, far away. It can be felt in a dungeon as much as it can be felt right here, right now. We can't escape his love. That's what we read when we read the wonderful words of Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? You hem me in before and behind. There's no escape from God's love for his children. God has a love for everyone in this world, Christian and non-Christian alike. We read in Matthew 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's what is known in theology as common grace. That God does have a love for the whole of creation. In that, he gives life to all. He gives grace in a very real sense to all. But then there is a, a different type of love that God has for his children. And that is his electing, adopting salvific love that we read about in Romans chapter 8, 28 to 30. And that love is the same love with which he loves Jesus Christ, as I said earlier. Brothers and sisters, we mustn't be content with a real, just a mere rational knowledge of God's love. Equally, we can't be content with just a feelings knowledge of God's love. We've got to pull in both. Now, I think in many ways, in the past 200 years, since the age of the Enlightenment, when the feelings were looked upon as something that was not to be trusted, I think many theologians have sort of ducked out of preaching and teaching the love of God as something to be understood by the feelings and emotions. But... Love can't be reduced to a doctrinal fact. Charles Hodge, the theologian, said this, Love of necessity involves feelings. And if there is not feeling in God, then there can be no love. God has feelings for you. That's an incredible truth. He has immutable, unchanging feelings of strong love. Towards me, I don't, I don't know how. Sometimes when I look at myself, I find myself hard to love. But God has immutable, unchanging, powerful, ever-present feelings of love towards me. He has feelings of love towards his children. And that will never change. I want you to consider that for a moment. When you find yourself abhorrent 
There's a real truth to that. Sometimes I'm greatly discouraged by myself. And if I allowed my subjective feelings about myself to dominate my life, I don't suppose that I would be able to love many other people since I couldn't love myself. And I think here there is a call by John to focus not our own, on our own rather ability to love, but on God's love towards us. There are days when that fact of God's unchanging love towards me just seems absurd. How could a perfect, holy, all-powerful God love me? And sometimes I don't feel God's love in those moments. And that's why I think John adds this. He says, we have known and believed his love for us. Christians, we also have to, by faith, believe that God loves us. This is something we have to remind ourselves in those moments where we can feel so discouraged by our own failures that God really does love you with a perfect, holy, powerful love. We're not to just know it, but we're to believe it. And this perfect love with which we're loved, it's that perfect love that that John says casts out fear. You see, this love also has a cleansing effect on us. It cleans us out. He says that perfect love casts out fear. And the Greek there is exobale, which means literally to throw out. It's the same phrase that's used in the Gospels for when Jesus casts out a demon. It's almost like it's saying there's a, there's a violent clash going on between two powers. There's fear and then there's God's love and it's God's love that prevails. What kind of fear is cast out? What does that mean? I know that even though God's love has been shed abroad in my heart, I know that there are still things that I fear. Tarantulas to name one, for sure. I saw a video the other day in Australia with guys taking huntsman spiders off the wall and throwing them on another. Like, that's my worst nightmare. I can just about cope with house spiders, but don't take me to Australia. I know there are some things that I still fear. So is that what's meant here? That God will remove fear of arachnids? Well, I wouldn't put it outside the realm of possibility, but I think what John means here more specifically is this, that the fear that we have of punishment is taken away. The fear that we have of being judged by God on that final day, that primarily is the fear which is cast out. It's this that Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. So therefore we have no fear now that we're going to end up on the wrong side of the dividing line on that great and terrible day. Secondly, I believe it's this. It's a fear of rejection that gets cast out. Firstly, a fear of rejection by God. That nagging fear that the imposter syndrome, maybe I'm just faking it all. Maybe God doesn't really love me. Maybe I'll be one of those people mentioned by Jesus, you know, away from me, I never knew you. Maybe that's me. Perfect love works to cast out that fear of rejection by God. We know that we're sons. We know that we're forgiven. We know experientially and rationally that there is no condemnation for us now, that that we're covered by his grace. We know this because we trust only in Jesus Christ for our salvation. We're not trusting as those people did who approached Jesus in our works. We're not coming to God and saying, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we heal the sick? God, didn't we draw crowds? And didn't we raise lots of money and do lots of wonderful things? No, 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 no. We don't approach Jesus like that when we are filled with perfect love. We approach and say, I do not trust in anything within me, anything without me, other than the name of Jesus for my salvation. That's how we know, is that he is the only thing that we cling to for our salvation. Finally, I believe the fear that's cast out of us is this. It's not just a fear of rejection by God, it's a fear of rejection by men. 
The fear of man is a snare, as the Bible says. And God's perfect love, by definition, puts in our heart a fear of God. That's the funny thing about what Scripture says, is that despite this close relationship we now have with God, that we're children of God, that we're lavish with the same love that the Father loves the Son, there is still a, a holy fear of God that has to be present in our lives. And it's that fear, that holy fear of God, that means there's no room for a fear of man. There's no fear of rejection by man in the heart of a Christian who's been perfected or completed in, in love. We're not so much worried about what people will think of us anymore. So, the evidence that we're being perfected in his love is this. It's that we love God in return. We love God in return. That is a miraculous thing. That is a supernatural thing, is what the Bible says. Now, it might not sound quite so stupendous to you when I said the evidence that you're being perfected in love is that you actually love God. You might say, well, yeah. You know, I've always loved God. I, I was born a Christian. You know, I went to church. I've always been open to the things of God. I, I love God. I always have. But the Bible says no such truth. It says this. It says you were not born loving God, not by any stretch. Rather than being born loving God, you were instead born as a child of wrath, a child of disobedience. Colossians 3 verse 6, Ephesians 2 verse 3. Paul goes so far as to say that we were haters of God. So what do we say then to somebody who says, well, that's not true. I, I love God. I've always loved God. Well, we say, which God? Which God do you love? Is it the God of the Bible? Or is it a different God? Sure, it's easy to love a God who's just like you. It's easy to love a God who always agrees with you and thinks just like you think. It's easy to love a God who doesn't exist. But when it comes to the God of the Bible, the God who does exist, the natural response of any sinner is actually hatred. So we love him not by our own virtue, but by his. John says that, you love because he first loved you. God's love for you is not a thing because you loved him. That's what that means. God doesn't love you because he looked at you and saw something virtuous in you. God doesn't love you because you chose him. God's love precedes any love that you have for him. We read in Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Listen to this. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Brothers and sisters, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. While we were weak, he was strong. At the right time, Christ came and died for you well before you deserved it. Our love for God, however imperfect it may be, exists because he loves you. My question is this. Do you love God? Do you love God today? If the answer is yes, then that's because he loved you first. Nobody who loves God has any reason to fear, has any reason to be worried when we look forward to that great day of judgment and there will be a great day of judgment. Anybody who loves the God of the Bible has no reason 
to fear that day. That's what's being said here. Perhaps you would answer that question, do you love God? Yes, but. Because I know in my heart, my love for God doesn't burn anywhere near as brightly as I would want it to. Do you want to love God more? Do you know that the love you have in your heart for him isn't anywhere near great enough? Doesn't begin to mirror his beauty and his worth. Well, my words for you today would be, don't fear. (laughs) Don't fear. We're all being perfected in love. The way that we cause that love to grow isn't by flagellating ourselves and saying, come on, love God more. Be a better Christian. Read some books about people who are better than you. Well, there's merit in that. But actually, the way that we cause our love for God to grow is not by looking within ourselves. It's by focusing on his love for us. How often a day do you think about God's love for you? How many times do you stop what you're doing and just stand in his presence and say, I can't believe that the creator of all this knows me by name. He's numbered the hairs on my head and he loves me in spite of everything that I do. He knows you, he sees you, he cherishes you in a perfect way. Our love for God grows in direct proportion to our knowledge of his love for us. Do you know that God loves you? All I would say is this. If you're living with any fear, if you know you're not right with God, if you know there is no love for God in your heart, And that if there is a great, terrible day of the Lord, when he will judge the living and the dead, you are not sure where you'll be. Come to Jesus now. It's never too late. And it's never too early. There are many that when you put this before them and say, turn to Jesus, they'll say, oh, I will, but perhaps later. Perhaps when I've had children, perhaps when I've settled down, perhaps when I've had a chance to do all the things that I want to do, I'll turn to Jesus. If there's anything that should be very clear to us in these days, it's that tomorrow is not promised. We do not know what's going to be coming tomorrow. Turn to Jesus today. Be set free from fear. Be set free from judgment. Come into that love of God, the perfect, holy, pure Love of God. Jesus is God's evidence of love for us all. Jesus is what God gave as his promise of love for all. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that all who believe in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray, and I'm going to invite Pippa to just come up and, and lead us in a, in a final song of worship. Father God, we thank you for your love, which is pure, holy, never changing, powerful, mighty, all present, everywhere we may be, we have access to your love. You hem us in before and behind. Lord, it's my prayer today that as a fellowship of believers that we would grow in our love towards you. I pray, Lord God, that there would be supernatural encounters of your love for us. Lord, that we begin to open up in a fresh way to know the love of the Father for us. Father, for those of us who have known your love, I pray that we would believe that love today. For those of us who wish to grow in that love and are still struggling with fear and doubt, Lord, help us to believe. Help us and help us in our unbelief. Lord, for those who may be watching today or watching this stream afterwards who know that they have no sure hope, they have no belief 
in Christ present in their heart. And they've got no love for God. <coughs> Lord, we pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be given to them now so that they may turn from their sins and follow him today. If that's you, get on your knees now. Begin to ask for forgiveness. Begin to ask that the Lord would grant you forgiveness of your sins. Give your life to him today. And be filled with his perfect love. We pray this in the name of the mighty Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Let's sing that again. You unravel me. You unravel me. With the melody, you surround me with this song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. That I I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. Oh, from my mother's womb, from my mother's womb. You have chosen me, love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins. child of God I'm no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear but I I am a child.
Father, we thank you that we love because you have loved us first. You have loved us first. Well, thank you, Pippa. I never call her Pippa. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, Graham. Thanks for joining us. It's been great to spend some time together uh, worshipping God and praising Him. So I pray that you have uh, a great rest of your day and a great week. And we will see you on Tuesday on Zoom, where Graham will be showing his uh, flipping, flipping techers uh, and melting saucepans and stuff like that. So we'll see you on Tuesday, and then we'll be back together uh, next Sunday. So thank you so much for joining us, and be blessed. Bye.